Okay, we are now reconvening the uh, budget hearings and we're with the uh, Metropolitan National Public Schools. And um, I thank you, Dr. Register, Mr. Henson, and Ms. Shepard for being here today. Um, I want to recognize from the Metro Council, we have with us uh, Ronnie Stein and Bill Pridemore, who's the Chair of Budget and Finance, uh, school board members, um, Anna Shepard, who I've mentioned, and Mary Pierce are with us. Uh, thank you both. Uh, Dr. Register, this is our last budget hearing together. Um, I guess it's mine, period, as mayor. Period, so yeah. you know, somebody got a cake they want to bring out here. But uh, <laughs> we discussed uh, perhaps something besides cake. Never mind. But before we begin, I want to say what it's pleasure has been to work with you for the past several years. Um, I think that we've always made sure that uh, our decisions and opinions were driven by what we believe is the best for our youngest citizens. I think we've worked to see improvements under in the system under your leadership. Um, when you came here in 2009, uh, we were on the verge of state takeover. Uh, you navigated with patience and a steady hand through some turbulent times, and we've come a long way. Our district has grown by almost 10,000 students. Uh, we've increased school funding over the past six years with almost $400 million in capital funds going to schools and your operating budget increasing more than 25%. Graduation rates are up, dropout rates are down, uh, TCAP and ACT scores have improved um, even as standards have been raised. And school choice has increased dramatically from the choice schools in the district uh, to our uh, effective charter school sector. Thousands of students now have access to high quality education options that uh, didn't exist before in our history. And while there's certainly much work still to do, I appreciate the hard work you have done and I firmly believe that our city students are in a better place because of your leadership. And our city is in a better place because of your dedication and passion. So on behalf of myself and everybody in my office and the city, thank you. And now we can get to the business at hand, which is this year's budget, and however you all wish to proceed. Thank you, Mayor Green. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, I have, my name is Anna Shepard, and I had the pleasure of uh, chairing both um, the budget and both the budget and finance committees for Metro National Public School Board of Education this year, both the capital needs and the operational. Uh, we have had much meaningful discussion around both budgets. This past Tuesday, the Board of Education approved the operation budget, both in committee and on the board floor. Both bo votes were unanimous. If you've been watching lately, you know that we don't have unanimous votes very often, so I'm always pretty pumped to get this vote. Uh, we do have some uh, initiatives in this year's budget that I'm, I'm very passionate about, a couple of them being uh, expanding our pre-K model by 500 seats and uh, expanding our community achieves model for the wraparound services for our most neediest students. Um, we have some other initiatives that are also, uh, uh, of course, going to be only beneficial for our students. And with that, I'll let Dr. Register make his opening comments. Thank you, Ms. Shepard. Uh, Mayor, thank you for your uh, introductory remarks. And, uh, and, at, and I'll take a moment of personal privilege to say it's been a pleasure over the last six years. I've been a superintendent 27 years now in two different states. And I've got to say that the support that we've received from you and from Metro Council is second to none. Uh, and, uh, and I really appreciate the commitment that you've made. You've said that education's a top priority uh, in Nashville and, and, uh, and, you've, uh, and you've shown that with the great support that you've given public education here in Metropolitan Nashville. So, uh, so I want to thank you and, and Metro Council for really joining hands and being partners with us in trying to advance the cause of public education uh, in, in Nashville. Um, we'll, I'll make a few brief remarks, some opening remarks about our budget and then, and then turn it over to Mr. Henson to walk through the budget. Uh, we uh, felt like this year it was uh, appropriate to take a conservative approach and, and in my opinion it is a conservative approach to the budget. Uh, we are asking for a 2.8% increase in the operating budget. Uh, but uh, at, as I come to the end of my uh, tenure here. Uh, it, it really is not the time for us to take off on new major initiatives in the school system. Uh, and this budget uh, 
uh, reflects that. Um, what, there are some program increases included in the budget this year that are continuation and, and expansion, and we think these are necessary, and, and we can talk through those. Uh, but we've tried to keep those to a minimum also to present a budget that is, uh, it, it does have an increase, and, and we, we know that. It is a, it is a big budget, uh, but we tried to keep, uh, keep those increases to a minimum. I'll say one, one uh, challenge that we faced this year that's, that you can see reflected in our budget is that the race to the top funding that we received from the federal government is, is depleted. Uh, that is over, that was a great asset to us over the last few years, $40 million. Uh, and, uh, and there are uh, eight positions in our budget that we are <coughs> transferring into the operating budget from race to the top. Those are critical positions. Uh, through the race to the top years, we made it a point to try to keep uh, uh, to, to try to not have a, a funding cliff at the end of that time. And I think we've done pretty well with that. Uh, and, and so there's not a huge impact for, for the loss of those funds, but, uh, but we've been able to uh, adjust accordingly, I think. Um, some, some uh, uh, I'll mention uh, four um, increases that are programmatic changes. Uh, and then I'm going to ask Chris to walk through the other details of the budget. Uh, you'll see in, in the budget, uh, in round figures, a $5 million increase <coughs> for student-based budgeting. Uh, this has been a, 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 a work in progress. This is, uh, we've start, we started this, we've done a phase in and a gear up to this. It's about a three-year process, really, for, for looking at student-based budgeting. And that is giving additional funds to schools uh, uh, who uh, that ha through a weighted student funding formula, where we weight funds to students with uh, special needs, to English learners, to uh, children who live in are economically disadvantaged. Uh, we put additional funds in the budget for those on a formula, and we also give greater flexibility and autonomy to uh, our principals in the use of those funds. We'd be glad to talk more about the student-based budgeting uh, if you have if you have questions about that. Uh, we also are uh, including uh, $1.1 million in the budget for expansion of English Learner Services. Uh, we feel really good about how our program's developed uh, in English Learner Services. Uh, it is, it, it is a, a growing population for us, uh, and, uh, and this gives us uh, some additional positions in the budget to provide direct service to uh, students and to families uh, who are English learner families. Um, we have $1.3 million in the budget for expansion of our literacy program. We're very proud of of uh, how our literacy program's developing. This will be the second year that we've had an increase uh, of this amount, and essentially what that does is buy additional reading, uh, reading teachers uh, and, and uh, uh, coaches for, for that program. Uh, and then finally, um, the, uh, Ms. Shepard mentioned this, and this is a program that we're that we're uh, very, uh, very positive about, and that's the expansion of Community Achieves, which is our wraparound services for children and families. Uh, we're in 14 sites now. Uh, we want to expand that, and there's an expansion in the budget of $1.2 million uh, to do that. Uh, I'll turn it over to Mr. Henson now to walk through the details of the budget, and then we'll be glad to entertain questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Register. Uh, you have in front of you a, a fact sheet that is a one-page summary of many of the things that, that both Ms. Shepard and Dr. Register just mentioned. Um, and we'll be going through a lot of these as we talk through uh, the summary. You also have behind the fact sheet a one-page summary of those five major district initiatives uh, that, uh, that were, were previously mentioned uh, that I'll also be talking about as we go through the, the budget summary. So if you'll, uh, if you'll take your bound copy of the budget, and I will remind everyone this budget uh, is and has been on the MNPS website uh, for, for all to, to see. We began this process back uh, in December, as we typically do our budget process, working through the months of January and February to put together a a first draft proposal to the school board, which was presented to them on March the 10th. 
And since that time, uh, Ms. Shepard has led the Budget and Finance Committee of the School Board through a series of committee meetings to get to the point where this past Tuesday evening on April 14th, the committee recommended and the full board approved uh, this budget that you have in front of you. So if you turn to the first page, uh, you'll see at the, the top right corner uh, has a document number, document number one, bottom right corner is a page number. And uh, we'll stay on page one here for a few minutes uh, because this is a summary of, of changes that are included in this year's budget proposal. But we do have a 2% salary increase included in the budget for all of our employees, both certificated and support employees. Um, this will be partially offset by the additional state funding that's included in the governor's budget that will be included in the state's funding formula, the VEP, where the, the latest estimate is, uh, as a school district, we will receive approximately $6.8 million through the formula as part of the governor's budget for uh, increased teacher compensation. The total increased cost for the district for this 2% uh, salary increase is approximately $9.5 million, just under $9.5 million. We also have all of the, the budgetary impacts. Uh, you can see for our certificated employees, the, the insurance proposal is no change, no change in rates. Uh, our, as you know, our insurance for our certificated employees is governed by the uh, Professional Employees Insurance Trust, which is a separate fund that uh, administers this particular program. It, uh, the membership is made up of three school board members, three MNEA representatives, a retired teacher representative, and an administration representative. And they, based upon the current financial condition of the insurance trust fund, which is in a very healthy condition, uh, they have recommended no change to the program as far as premium costs. We also have in the middle part of that top section uh, certificated pension. Uh, there is not a change to the state pension rate. Uh, all of our certificated employees are required to be members of the state retirement plan, the Tennessee Consolidated Retirement System, or TCRS, and there is no change to that employer contribution rate for that defined benefit plan. We also have the support insurance and support pension down uh, in the bottom part of that upper section. Um, we have uh, included uh, no change for our support employees insurance, which all of our support employees, their benefit program is governed by the Metro Employee Benefit Board. And we also are reflecting the decrease in the pension costs uh, through the Metro Employee Benefit Board, which is about a $1.8 million savings or $1.8 million reduction uh, to the budget. Budget. If you look in the middle part of the, this page, we have uh, some inflationary increases. Uh, we have uh, increases to the budget as far as a transfer from the general purpose fund to the charter school fund. Uh, we are opening seven new charter schools this coming year, and we have a number of existing charter schools that will be expanding and adding additional grades uh, at their schools. Have a separate document, document number nine, which details all of that information. Uh, for you uh, that we'll get to in just a moment. Uh, we also have uh, two district schools that will be opening this year, Waverly Belmont Elementary School in the 12th South area of town, as well as the new Smith Springs Elementary that is out in the Antioch Cane Ridge area of town. Both of those uh, schools will be opening this fall. Uh, they have site-based costs associated with them, have a separate document, document number seven, that reflects uh, those uh, budgetary impacts. We also are including the reduction of the operating transfer to our debt service fund, which was included in, in uh, the, the last year budget, which is the current year, of approximately $16.1 million. So we get to uh, a point in the middle part of the page of about a $12.7 million uh, increase as far as employee compensation and other uh, additional expenses before we get to the bottom part where we have our proposed changes, which this is where we uh, typically reflect those major district initiatives. Uh, those have previously uh, been uh, mentioned by Ms. Shepard and Dr. Register. Uh, and you also have, as I said, you also have a one-page summary for each of these included behind the, the budget fact sheet. Our literacy program expansion, this is our the reading recovery program, uh, which is an intensive uh, program to elevate the, uh, the achievement in reading of our lowest performing uh, students. Uh, there is an expansion of this program of additional reading recovery teachers as well as uh, reading interventionists. 
of about $1.3, $1.4 million. Again, uh, there is further detail on, on this one-page summary uh, behind the fact sheet. We also are including in our budget proposal uh, additional funds for leadership stipends. This is, uh, this is money for teachers who take on additional leadership roles within the building. Um, this was a recommendation from the Chamber of Commerce Education Report Card Committee that we also provide supplements or stipends to our uh, teachers uh, similar to the way we do for our coaches, our athletic coaches. And this would be, again, uh, there's a one-page summary behind the literacy program that details the types of uh, roles that these teachers might play as far as receiving this stipend, uh, such as content team chairs or mentor leaders of new teachers, multi-classroom leaders, instructional coaches, etc., uh, that you can, uh, you can view there. Uh, as Dr. Register said, we are including additional funding in the budget uh, for to provide additional services for our English language learners. Uh, this is a, a one-page summary uh, next behind the leadership stipends, approximately $1.1 $1 million increase. Uh, it's both uh, direct uh, student instruction as far as additional English learner teachers as well as additional staff to work with our uh, immigrant families, uh, translators, uh, uh, registrars to, to properly uh, register and place students, uh, assessor to properly assess the students as they come into the school district, and you can see all of that on a one-page summary uh, behind the leadership stipends. Community Achieves, this is a program that uh, was instituted under Race to the Top. Uh, we are looking to continue this program and to expand it to provide those wraparound social services to students and families, our highest need students and families uh, in our highest need schools. And uh, this provides staff members at those schools to coordinate all of those services, to coordinate the services that nonprofits provide, uh, to uh, help students in areas that that are outside of academics that uh, are very important uh, for students and for our families. We also have here the reduction in the budget relating to uh, the latest uh, fuel hedging contract. Uh, we're very happy to participate in the, the fuel hedging contracts uh, that have been in place. Uh, we've saved, uh, as a school district, we've saved uh, approximately $800,000 since this, uh, since the contracts were initiated. Uh, we're very happy that as we look uh, as we look forward uh, to the new contracts that are in place. You can see a significant reduction as it relates relates to having these contracts in place, we're estimating about a $1.4 million savings. And then the last item that I'll mention on this page, uh, the student-based budgeting. Uh, as Dr. Register mentioned, this is an effort to provide more equitable distribution of resources to our schools based upon the individual student needs that exist in those schools. To provide a more level playing field for, for schools that have high concentration uh, of, of high need students for English learner students, for exceptional education students, students living in poverty and low academic performing students. What we're doing here is we're providing additional resources to similarly situated schools uh, where currently we have some schools that receive additional resources either because they are an enhanced option elementary school that has lower class sizes and goes to school a longer day. And we also have schools that uh, receive additional resources through the 2008-2009 student assignment plan. And so we hold all of those schools harmless as far as we're not taking any money from any school to give to another school. Uh, their per pupil expenditure amounts or per pupil funding amounts will remain steady. What we're doing is providing additional funding to these high need schools, particularly in the area of English learners. Uh, we feel like our, our high, high EL schools haven't been receiving an equitable distribution of resources based upon student need. So there, there's an estimated cost of approximately $5 million to do that. This will actually be a two-year phase-in of this weighted student funding formula where we have a base amount of, of money for each student and then there are weights added onto that based upon the individual needs of those students in those schools for English learners, for exceptional ed students, for economically disadvantaged students, and for low academic uh, performing students. Students. 
We have a, a budget request of $812.5 million, as Dr. Register said, a 2.8% increase, uh, approximately $22.5 million increase. In a nutshell, those are the summary. I mean, those are that is the summary of the changes from the current year budget. And then I'll fairly briefly walk through some of the supporting documents that we have, just so you're aware of what's included uh, in the budget. If you turn to, to page two, uh, as we have uh, every year, we provide a, uh, a proposed position changes document that goes into uh, high detail regarding position changes. Uh, we've included this every year. If you go to page three, we have our 10-month support employee work calendars. There is no change as far as our 10-month employee work calendars. They're heavily based upon number of student days. We also have uh, paid uh, time off days for these em employees, uh, 16 of those. We have additional paid days that, they're, uh, that they work where students aren't in school for orientation and training and administrative duties. Page four just provides a breakdown of our uh, three pre-K model centers and our pre-K model program. Uh, of course, the centers, uh, as you know, are at Ross, Bordeaux, and Casa Azafran. And we have a separate account, account number 2328, uh, that represents uh, this, uh, this particular initiative if you, when you look into the, the line item budget. Page five just shows some detail as it relates to our two alternative learning centers, Johnson and Bass. Uh, this is account number 2600. Again, this just provides more, a, a higher level of detail as to the numbers that are included in the line item budget. Likewise, page six, our non-traditional schools. We have a separate account, account number 2650. This provides the detail for all of those. Uh, the middle college program at Nashville State, uh, big picture school at Martha Vaught, our three academies that we have now, our virtual school, and our transitions uh, program at Bass and the Cone School. As I said uh, earlier, when we were looking at the summary, page seven, which is document number, document number seven, details the additional costs for opening new district schools. We have a, an account, account number 2700 for that purpose. Uh, as I said, uh, Smith Springs Elementary and Waverly Belmont Elementary will open this coming year. And we have some site-specific costs as it relates to opening new schools, such as a principal, uh, counselor, librarian, secretary, bookkeeper, et cetera, that we account for separately, uh, including utility costs and custodial services and grounds that we capture in a separate account. Document eight, uh, as was promised through the student assignment plan that was approved in 2008, we continue to provide a separate schedule uh, for additional resources that are provided to these nine schools. Uh, it's, uh, as you can see, it's six elementary schools, two middle schools, and one high school. And we continue to provide transportation to those students and families that want to attend school outside of this, the Pearl Cone zone and want to continue uh, to go to school in the Hillwood uh, cluster. And so we, we captured the cost for that transportation here within this account number 2710. Document number nine, as I mentioned when we were looking at the summary, uh, breaks down uh, for you all of our charter schools. We currently, uh, this year, have 19, and as I said, we will be uh, adding seven more next year for a total of 26 district charter schools. We also have two uh, schools in the state's Achievement School District, uh, Brick Church and Neely's Bend. And you can see uh, the numbers as, uh, as far as estimated numbers of students. At this point in time, we're estimating the, the per pupil amount of state and local revenue at, at $9,000. Uh, and you can see the estimated allocation for each of these schools for next year. The asterisk indicates that uh, these are schools that are adding a grade, that are expanding. And then a, a double asterisk uh, shows that the Achievement School District, we don't actually, this, these funds don't flow through the district. They are taken off of the top of the school district state BEP funding, and they are sent directly from the State Department of Education to the Achievement School District to be distributed to these schools based upon student enrollment. So the schools that are listed as new schools, these would have been schools that were approved by the board last year. That's correct. Okay. 
And then on page 10, uh, this is the first page of the uh, detailed line item budget, 29 page line item budget. Uh, this is document number 10. Uh, not going to go through every page and, and be happy to, to answer any questions you may have regarding it, but just setting up the format. Uh, columns C and D on this document reflect the current year approved positions and budget. Uh, columns E and F represent the proposed changes in numbers of positions and changes in budget resulting in columns G and H, which would be the proposed positions and proposed budget for next year. We also in column I always include some remarks, uh, try to provide some explanation as it relates to uh, positions, as it relates to specific line items. Um, but again, this is a, a 29 page detailed uh, line item budget. If you turn over to page 39, which would be the, uh, the page after the end of the, the detailed line item budget, as we have in previous years, we include uh, what I call a, a cheat sheet uh, that lists, uh, it's in uh, alpha sort that lists the account name and the account number. So if, if you have an idea of the uh, account name, what it might be called, hopefully you can find uh, the account number uh, in the detailed line item budget. Going over to page 42, 40, page 42 uh, begins our Nutrition Services Fund, which is a self-supporting enterprise fund. Page 43 represents uh, a summary of revenue and expenditures. Uh, for 2015-16, budgeted revenue is approximately $48.8 million. The, uh, the largest source of that funding, as you can see, would be federal USDA meal reimbursements. Uh, as you know, the district uh, this year participated in the community eligibility provision, which allows for no cost breakfast, no cost lunch to uh, any and all student in the school district. And so you, what you do not see in the revenue would be payments made by students and parents. Uh, so, as I said, the, the, by far the largest source of, of revenue is federal USDA meal reimbursements. There's also federal USDA fresh fruit and vegetables grant funding included here. Uh, there's a la carte sales, which would be those sales that are made to students uh, outside the regular meal that they, can, that they can continue to purchase and a very small amount of state funding, uh, state matching funding that goes into the Nutrition Services Fund. That in the your ability to provide the free meals is just dependent upon the federal government maintaining these this level of commitment to that. that that's correct. It's 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 based upon uh, participation in the program, and and we have had very high participation in the program. It's based upon uh, economic makeup of the student body, uh, mm -hmm. because there's a, a higher reimbursement rate for students that qualify for uh, free and reduced lunch status. And uh, it's, it's sort of a pilot program, but we, we hopefully foresee this pilot program continuing uh, for us. It's been a, a, a major success in right, the school district. It's a sensational district. program. And yeah. we, I don't want to get away from, I'll forget to come back to this, but we did an event at um, East High School, I believe, where you sort of focused on the quality and the nutritional value of the way <coughs> food is being prepared now in school. You might want to talk about that, because I was really impressed with that. It's uh, uh, Fred Cars in the room, I think. Fred's, uh, uh, Fred's our person who, who really uh, drives this program for us, and along with our child nutrition people, I'd, I'd like to recognize Fred to say a word about it, if I may. Thank you. Mayor Dean, the, the community eligibility is a four-year program to be reviewed by the USDA at the end of four years. So we anticipate participating in it for as long as, as it exists. In addition to that, we have hired uh, a new chef whose focus is meeting the new nutritional guidelines set forth by USDA and doing it in a way that it is attractive to kids. We have increased our uh, number of meals served this year compared to last year by about 20,000 a day. Wow, that's breakfast and lunch. That's, great. that's significant. It's an incredible achievement. Thank you. And I ask for uh, the other statistic, and I'll miss this a little bit, but uh, we're serving uh, uh, almost 93,000 meals a day now uh, to the young people. 
if you look at the bottom portion of the page, it, it just reflects expenditures, budgeted expenditures. Of course, the, the two largest would be uh, salaries and benefits for the staff uh, in, the, in the cafeterias, as well as the food purchases. Food purchases estimate approximately $18.7 million. The uh, Nutrition Services Fund also pays for its share of the utility costs in the kitchen, and you can see utilities we're estimating at uh, $1.2 million that uh, the Nutrition Services Fund actually pays in relation to the district's utilities. Uh, we're, we're projecting a balanced budget, uh, revenue and expenditures balancing at approximately $48.8 million. If you go to the next page, page 44, all this does is reflect uh, all of the expenditures for the Nutrition Services Fund in a similar format to our document number 10, the, the detailed line item budget for salaries, food, supplies and materials, equipment, travel, et cetera. Uh, again, the total budget, uh, $48.8 million for this program. Page 45, we just show the employee work calendars for our uh, nutrition services staff. It's unchanged from the current year based upon, again, uh, number of student days, uh, paid time off days, orientation training, and administrative duties. And then as uh, both Mr. Carr and Dr. Register mentioned, page 46, we do have some statistics in here uh, regarding uh, meal count comparisons. So if you look in, on the left-hand column, total meals served, and this is just through March. If you look at the, the comparison there, uh, 9.5 million this past year, and we're sitting at about 12 million meals served uh, in the current year. And again, just, just through March, you can see the breakdown uh, of breakfast and lunch lunch comparing one year to the next, significant increases, as well as an increase in ADP, which is the acronym for Average Daily Participation. Uh, as Dr. Register said, uh, average daily participation is over 93,000 meals uh, being served, both breakfast and lunch, in the current year compared to 74,000 meals in the prior year. The last section uh, on page four, beginning on page 47 would be the federal programs and grants. This is uh, flow through funding, uh, in many cases very prescriptive as far as how these funds can be spent. All of these are reimbursable grants and as a reminder the federal fiscal year runs October 1st through September 30th. So what we do at this point in the year is to provide our best estimate of what we think these uh, different programs and grants are going to be funded and on page 48 what we do is we produce project what we are going to spend based upon our fiscal year of July 1 to June 30th. Um, and so you've got the grant name to the left and then you've got 14-15 uh, for reference what was approved in the budget and then what's being projected for 15-16 for next year. Uh, as you know, by far the largest federal grant is the Title I program. Uh, we are projecting basically a, a flat budget for Title I. Uh, next largest, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or federal IDEA funding, projecting a slight increase there. Uh, the next uh, item is uh, one that uh, Dr. Register may want to talk about a little bit, the new uh, federal pre-K grant through the state where uh, we have over uh, a certain number of years, we have received uh, along with Shelby County significant funding uh, to expand our pre-K offerings. Yeah, I'll say a word about that. We're, we're very proud of the fact that we're, uh, we were given the award. Um, and and uh, we, I had, I've had some questions several different times about this, and that is, is there a local match? And uh, thanks to uh, the support that you gave last year in allowing us to use local dollars to expand our pre-K funds, all matches have been met for the entire grant. Uh, so we don't have a uh, we don't have to uh, to worry about that. This total grant for us will be 30, 33 million dollars uh, to expand pre-K. And uh, uh, I want to I want to say a word about the partnerships, if I may. Uh, we uh, the, our pre-K program, our model centers are there. We we operate in 57 other sites. It might be up one or two now. I guess. I guess uh, 60 sites counting the three model centers now at the present time. Uh, and we're also partnering with Head Start uh, and with uh, private providers to uh, look at the curriculum and the program that's being offered, 
uh, we're, we're working in partnership with Vanderbilt and with, uh, with other folks to really develop what I think is the best pre-K curriculum and instructional program in the country. We already have that in our model centers. And a lot of this grant will be used to expand that quality program into all of our other sites. So we see a, a, a big opportunity to, in, to really improve the quality of program that all of our four-year-olds get uh, uh, in Davidson County. I'm very excited about that. I think it, w it can be attainable in the near future uh, over, the next, uh, over the next three or four years uh, to really get to where we serve every child in Davidson County who wants and needs a pre-K program with a high quality good. program. Good, very good. And, and that is differentiated from the next line here, the pre-K state grant, which this uh, comes from lottery funding, which uh, the district has received for a number of years. Uh, as you know, the, the governor and the legislature are not uh, looking to expand that program, so it's uh, at a flat level. Uh, but that is a, a different pre-K grant than the, the new one that was just uh, announced and received. We also include our Title IIA funding, our Carl Perkins Career and Technical Education CTE funding for our high school CTE courses, Title III funding for our English language learners. The Teacher Incentive Fund, or the TIF grant, is ending. Uh, this will be the last year, and so we will be closing out that particular grant. Um, we do have some additional funding for our priority schools planning, a, pr a planning grant for our new, newly identified priority schools, as well as school improvement grant uh, funding for uh, priority schools in the school district. Uh, I'll just touch on a couple of others that are ending. Uh, of course, Race to the Top is ending. Uh, a companion of that is First to the Top. That's also ending, as well as the Magnet School Grant or Magnet School Assistance Program Grant. That, that particular grant is ending as well. So we, we include here uh, an estimate at this point of approximately uh, $78 million for federal programs and grants funding. Uh, again, uh, sort of as a placeholder, since uh, this is, these are all reimbursable grants, uh, and uh, this is our best estimate at this point relating to this uh, particular program. That concludes uh, my presentation of, of all of the budget documents. Be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let me first ask about um, this idea of um, student base budgeting, how, how do you just to describe that? Uh, did I understand that that's geared to help the kids who are most in need and so that more funds follow that student? Is that sort of yes. the basics? Yes, that's correct. Uh, and if you'll look at that single page handout, we can uh, highlight what we've done there. Um, uh, Chris, you might, you, you can explain this better than I can. Why don't you do that? Sure. If you will. What we've been doing over the last, uh, it's, it's been a three-year phase in. Uh, the first year, what we tried to do was what we called school-based budgeting, where we allowed um, a group of 17 schools in a pilot program, which were made up of all of our innovation zone schools, as well as any school that was led by a network lead principal. Uh, we allowed them uh, what we called school-based budgeting, uh, which is where instead of the school district base, based upon a staffing formula, or based on a set of staffing formulas telling schools based upon the number of students you have, these are the positions that you get. Uh, we said, okay, here's a pot of money that equates to the number of positions and types of positions that you would get. You tell us, based upon your school improvement plan and your student data, you tell us what you need, what, how you want this total pot of money budgeted and, and spent. We expanded that program this year uh, and included all of our middle schools and all of our high schools this year. Uh, and so uh, it's been very well received. Next year, what we're doing is expanding it to all of our schools, including all of our elementary schools. And at the same time, we're uh, transitioning from school-based budgeting to what we're calling student-based budgeting, which is where we have a weighted student formula, where you have a, a base amount of funding for each student, which is $4,250. And then based upon the individual needs of the students in each school, uh, and those needs that we are waiting, you can see on the one-page uh, summary document, 
we are weighting those, providing additional funding to the schools based upon the individual needs of students. And so it's not as if, it's not where the district is uh, providing a number and types of positions. What we're doing is trying to provide a more equitable distribution of resources to those schools that in, in, in the past may not have received an equitable share of funding because they weren't enhanced option schools or they weren't schools that received additional resources through the student assignment plan. And so what this is really doing is helping similarly situated schools receive uh, more equitable funding. And so it's really helping our, our high concentration EL schools that uh, previously haven't received the funding really that they should. Uh, it's helping, uh, as I said, provide more equity, but it also provides a lot of flexibility for principals and the principals building leadership teams based upon their school improvement plan and based upon their student data to tailor their own instructional design programs for their school. It also provides a lot of transparency as far as how much funding does each school get. Uh, it's, a, it's a formula, it's a calculation we can show based upon the, the weighted student for, formula how much each, uh, each school is receiving based upon the individual needs of students. There, there, are, there are other variables. This is a, a modest start to the weighted student funding formula, and uh, we, we think it's a pro, an appropriate start, but uh, I think the formula will become more sophisticated as time goes on so that we really are zeroing in on specific needs for each child in a building. We're, 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 uh, we're very pleased to be able to make this step this year. So additional money is requested because it's going to follow the needs of the students um, who, are, who, who have the most needs. And the additional money is there because you're not taking money from other That's schools. Correct. Everybody's That's being correct. held harmless. That's correct. And then for, in terms of charter schools, this doesn't affect them one way or the other because it's a per pupil, just That's follows correct. them. That's correct. As it is, okay. And then so what your goal would be over time, the, the amount of money being appropriated in this line item would go up. So there's more money going to the most in need students yes. without adversely affecting anybody else. That's correct. And, and also looking at what should be included in the pool of money right. that goes to schools um, because there's a healthy tension about what should go to schools and what should be retained at the district level and those services provided centrally. And what, what we're trying to do is to push as much of the funding and, and as many of the resources out to schools uh, as possible and as, as reasonable. And so what we're asking principals to do is question us about, some, about things that you think should be included in that pool and uh, let's have that discussion. And uh, so as Dr. Register said, this is a first year and so we tried to sort of keep it simple. Uh, we've got some really uh, strong consultants working with us. Uh, from Education Resource Strategies, uh, ERS, out of the Boston area. They've worked with many school districts across the country in Denver and Cleveland and Baltimore who have already implemented student-based budgeting. And, and the two things that I told ERS were, uh, one, I don't want to recreate the wheel. You know, if we've got uh, places that are doing this and doing this well, there's no reason to start from scratch and spend a whole lot of time on it. And secondly, I want to learn from others' mistakes. And so uh, if we're, I don't want to go down a road that, that's already been traveled and and, uh, and there's a pitfall. And so they've been very helpful as we've gone through this process. Okay. Now let me ask you about um, English language learners. Um, my understanding is we basically have 22,000 English language learners as students in the school system. Is that fair yes. ballpark figure? Yes. And I think you could always you could look at this two ways. It's clearly a challenge to a school system to teach students the English language at whatever grade that's necessary. It requires additional resources, but it's also one of the great um, I think advantages we have as a city that people are attracted to our city and want to come here to to make their lives. Um, you know, we've been honored to have two visits from the president, one to McGavick and one to sort of celebrate um, our reputation as an open city to welcoming immigrants. So I applaud the, the work you all have been doing. You're essentially asking for, if I understand this correctly, um, about 20 new employees specifically to meet English language learner needs. That's correct. Um, and so there's a significant, I guess, relative budget increase in those departments that um, 
of about 3.4 million. Is that fair to say? Well, the, the actual the increase as far as what we're asking here is about uh, 1.14 uh -huh. included in uh, the proposed changes. Um, that and, and they're highlighted here on the one-page summary of, uh, of where that that 1.14 million dollars would go. Uh, some of it is staff going directly to schools uh, for additional EL students for or for additional EL teachers, as mm -hmm. well as a number of uh, of staff members that provide services to our EL families. Uh, many times the translators are needed to be able to communicate with families and communicate with students and you can you, uh, you can see the, the types and numbers of positions as far as registering new students assessing students as they come into our school district etc our EL executive director gave me a, a new number last week uh, we we uh, the number he quoted and I ask regularly how many languages our children speak in our school system and the numbers vary but we're up to 150, 150. languages now. The, the difference that you mentioned may be in the fact that uh, part of the change to student-based budgeting as I mentioned went to uh, EL, high EL. All right, so that's schools. it, so that's yeah, following. That's, yeah, that's, okay. right. that's also that's right. going toward EL. All right, that's right. that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and I've, also, I've been briefed on a proposal by STEM prep to um, basically aggressively attack some of the challenges faced by English language learners. Right. And uh, the sense of this is that this would take about 100 students and put them into a program where um, English language learning is sort of the focus of the program that would be done at STEM. Yes. And this would um, be the highest need students for English language learners? Right. I, I would, uh, l let me uh, uh, ask Dr. Steele to address this. Jay, if you would uh, come up. And Jay and uh, uh, Kristen McGrainer have Kristen. been working on this, and Kristen is here. Uh, from from STEM, uh, and if you could explain a little bit of the detail of the program, please. Sure. Um, Kristen and I have been working together with um, Kevin Stacy, the EL Executive Director, to create a, um, a pilot program that we hope that we can get off the ground in a year from now, that we would um, renovate uh, a building on STEM Prep's campus, and we would target 100 students that are um, pre-production um, newcomers uh, to the city, and that we would create a model center there for professional development for EL teachers, that all teachers, all EL teachers in the district can come and learn the best practices around that and then expand in year two to um, a zoned school like Overton High School or Tusculum and then a third school the third year. So we would create three model centers for teacher professional development around EL strategies. Anything else? Yeah, I think that sums it up. I mean, the project is designed to accelerate uh, language acquisition and development for the kids who need it the most. Um, and then I think the point of promise in the project is to scale, um, to serve all kids um, who do have those really urgent needs in English language development. Okay, and so the, the first year, which would not be this coming academic year, it'd be the right. following one, right. would be at your, at STEM. Correct. And the request, to us this year is to fund in the city's capital budget uh, approximately seven hundred thousand dollars to convert the what's the field house into classrooms. Correct. And is that going to be enough money to do that? I believe so. Yes. All right. And then the other capital needs associated with getting this program up and running would be the computers for students and staff? Correct, correct. And uh, is there pretty widespread support for this? I mean, I, I'll, be, we say, I'll be gone. So we put this in the capital budget well, next year and we do the field house, then this, this is going to happen? I'll be gone too, but the answer is yes. <laughs> and, and I will say, we've toured the, the site on more than one occasion with, with Dr. McGrainer, and, and we will offer any, any assistance we can as far as um, architectural assistance, et cetera, as it relates to the capital portion of it, and, and we're excited about the partnership. And you'll still, the school system will still be in a position to use the, the track and the other athletic facilities that are outdoors there, is that right? Mm -hmm. Correct. I mean, it sounds like a win-win for everybody. Yes, absolutely, so. absolutely. 
if I might say a word, Mayor, um, I think I can speak for my colleagues when I say that we we I have the same opinion as you do. It's a celebration for us to have such a diverse, rich population, you know, diverse population, and though and we even realizing it's a challenge. So we want to be able to address and provide for them what these students need, and we're in, in support of anything that can get that done. So so uh, I, I it, this this proposal when uh, when Jay and and uh, Kristen came to talk to me about it uh, drew uh, drew immediate support for me uh, the program that's been developed it stems outstanding for newcomers in uh, AL and uh, Kristen won't say this but I'll say it for her. this she developed this program and uh, and we want our teachers to learn uh, this best practice and I think this model center is a great way to get it started so that would be in our capital the I'm looking at you, Bill, probably more. <laughs> that would be in our capital budget. Um, but I think you can see the schools as a wide, I'm not putting you on the spot here, I'm just making sure you guys, that the, the schools have a sort of broad support for this effort. Great, thank you. Um, so next year, um, in terms of um, staffing, there's, you can just explain so the people at home understand this. There's going to be, as I understand it, a projected decrease in traditional schools of 1,500 because of the increase in charter schools. But there is still um, increased staffing um, taking place, I think, to the amount of 104 employees. Could you just explain how, why and how that happens? And Sure, you're, you're correct, and, and the, the projections that we have show that the total overall district enrollment is projected to increase by approximately 1,500 students. Uh, that is a, uh, a gross number. The net effect of that is that the non-charter enrollment uh, is projected to decrease, and the charter enrollment is projected to increase, obviously increase more uh, than the decrease, um, or increase more uh, to, to make for a, a, an overall increase in the district student enrollment. If you look on the, the bottom of the fact sheet, we try to detail out uh, the majority of those positions uh, that, uh, that are being requested. Uh, as we uh, previously looked at document number seven, uh, we are opening two new, elementary, two new district elementary schools, and so you have uh, a certain number of positions, site-based positions associated with opening uh, new schools that will affect the operating budget. Uh, we have 24 and a half uh, additional positions for the expansion of our literacy program. This would include 21 uh, reading recovery teachers, uh, reading recovery trainer, as well as additional reading interventionists that are included in the budget. Uh, 18 of those uh, additional positions are the expansion of our services for English language learners uh, that we've that we've discussed. 16 of those positions are uh, the expansion, continuation, and expansion of our Community Achieves initiative, where we previously have been funding this initiative through Race to the Top funding that is ending moving this over to the, the local operating budget and expanding it at the same time. And as Dr. Register mentioned, we have eight positions that we're moving over from uh, Race to the Top or other, other federal grant programs that we feel are, are important to continue uh, moving forward. And since that uh, source of funding is ending, we've moved those over. Uh, we also have various uh, smaller numbers of positions uh, we're adding as far as additional needs relating to school psychologists. Uh, human capital as far as our recruiting efforts as we and as we transition to Kronos, our new uh, uh, time and attendance system. And so we have a, a number of other types of positions throughout that can be found throughout the line item budget, but those really are the majority of the, of the additional new positions. Okay. All makes sense. Um, and I should note that in terms of the literacy program, um, I'm sorry that Jill Spearing is not here because this is a big day for her. Um, reading recovery is a real focus of, right. of, of part of this. And Jill has been, I've known her for eight years and she's been a champion of that every day of those eight years. We're seeing, uh, we, we started that expansion last year. We're seeing some really good results from that. Uh, and so, and so, a second year, another increase, uh, and these positions will go to the schools that have the highest number of children who are behind grade level. And then, with community achieves, um, that's adding 1.7 million to the budget. Um, it's 
in its sort of wraparound services for schools. Could you just describe what that is so the viewers the, um, understand? Uh, it's the, Tony the, just walked in the door. So. Tony just walked in the door. Great. <laughs> Tony? 1.2 million. We'd, we'd like for you to, uh, uh, the mayor asked about uh, community achieves and what, what that program looks like, what, what the services are. So basically what community achieves is, it's a community school model in which we add one site coordinator to those schools that want to implement a full service community school model to complement the academic reform efforts already taking place in their schools. Basically what Community Chiefs uh, sets out to do is to address all the non-instructional needs for children and families by facilitating the services, the activities, events, and extended programming that can go into after school hours into the weekend to help meet those needs of students and families. What we've heard from our principals, of course, like I said, we've been trying doing this for about three years developing the model, is that they have other needs for staffing. They need additional staff to do different things, but they don't have someone to facilitate the process and management of all the partners and agencies and then to measure their effectiveness and outcomes. Community Chiefs uh, sets out to sort of to provide those services and the uh, person to facilitate the programming so that we can meet the non-instructional and social emotional needs of our kids and our families. Okay. Thank you. Greg? Okay. I know. No questions. Rich, surely. <laughs> I feel obligated now the pressure's on. Just a couple of things, Chris. Uh, you, you talked about the, um, the the BEP money. So where do you think you'll be in terms of overall growth in state dollars this year? Is uh, it, it 6.8 or is it somewhere around? Uh, actually, uh, if you look at compared to the budget, budget to budget, we're right. looking at about an $8.5 million increase. Um, and so that, that will be a significant new source of, of funding for, uh, based upon the, the expansions that are occurring that the, that the governor is proposing in the budget. Okay. And then just uh, one other question. Obviously, um, there's been a lot of discussion about reserves over the last year or so. Um, where, do you have a sense yet of where you think, um, I know we're 10 months into the nine months, into, almost 10 months into the school year, the fiscal year. Do you have a sense of where you think you are on your budget this year and kind of how where you think you'll end the fiscal year? Well, as you said, through nine months, I guess through March, um, uh, we're tracking very closely to where we were uh, last year, uh, which means that uh, uh, what we're seeing is that we're going to uh, exceed budget on revenue, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which we're, we're glad to see, particularly in the area of, uh, of sales tax. Which is similar across tax revenue. Not just schools, but for across government wide, right? Right. And yeah. then uh, on the expenditure side, we're, we're going to stay within budget. Uh, uh, we're tracking on the expenditure side very closely to where we were last year, which is spending between 98 and 99 percent of our budget uh, so we'll we'll stay within budget we'll have some left over the combination of the revenue and the expenditures okay. probably uh, are going to, to come in around the, the 19 to 20 million dollar to the to the positive, to the positive. Good. Uh, number uh, replenishment of a lot of what was used as far as right. fund balance right. in the current year budget got it good Very good Thank you. How's um, the Yume Fog edition going? I just drive by it a lot, so I'm curious. Uh. The uh, the gymnasium edition, yes, it's, it's going to be it's going to be very very nice. Uh, it's it will be ready this summer. Uh, it will definitely be ready by the time school starts, but it, it'll be ready uh, probably mid July. Uh, and then uh, we're still in the design phase of the full remodel, the renovation of of Hume Fog, mm -hmm. uh, which was approved in last year's capital budget, which we are very appreciative. Uh, still in that uh, design phase, probably looking. At at uh, a couple of years away for that to be completed for the for the <coughs> model that'll, that'll, renovation. That'll be a challenge uh, yeah. because we're thing. we're going to remodel with the children in the building, with the students in the building, and so we'll be shuffling children from one you wing to another. I, I won't, but I'll drive by and yeah. I'll drive by and watch. It's Stratford, so but, but it will take longer. Put on an apron uh, and you know right. not hammer a little bit, and maybe no, paint no, a little bit. No, 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 no. That's not part of your retirement plans. Stratford, you mentioned Stratford. Right, the same uh, situation. Uh, we were there last night uh, for a meeting, and it's coming along very nicely. Uh, it'll be about Christmas. So we're uh, looking at this December, December completion of Stratford. Completion of that $20 million renovation. Okay. Well, there's still some more work to do, but I, let me just say thank you for the budget. I think it was very, um, I think you're conservative, but productive things moving in the right direction. And I think the, this idea of student-based funding to me makes a world of sense. Um, so thank you for that. Let me um, 
give a shout out to the school system for the weather services this year. We had a, a tough year. We had a tough month. We didn't have a tough year. We had a tough month. Um, and uh, you all were up there with us at the Emergency Communication Center, and I appreciate all the hard work. And I know it's not the type of thing that you're going to make everybody happy, but you got to do the right thing. And I think the key thing was that people were safe. Right. And, and that's what really matters. Absolutely. So, um, Janelle, you want to say anything since you're on the opposite side of the fence here now? I think it's been great. <laughs> She's good, isn't she? <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much.